Hello, I'm Professor Jamin Bassett, again your visiting professor alone from Sungo University, and we'll be talking today about understanding Korean culture and traditional Korean culture. Now something I normally go into with my spiel in the first lecture that you know, I was kind of rushed uh, last time, had a lot to do in a short period of time. I normally do a spiel talking about reductionism. I think this is a good place to, to have that conversation right now. You know how sometimes we say things like, Beijing feels like this, Washington feels like this. You kind of have to summarize an entire country's opinion on a topic by saying, you know, oh, here's what they believe on this particular issue. If you spent any amount of time in your own country, you know there's no such thing as uh, general consensus on anything. <laughs> uh, it's the same is true for culture, right? Uh, but people are so diverse, humans are so diverse, when you try to discuss about them in a sociological setting, if you don't try to make it at least a little bit smaller and talk about major trends and major cultural through lines, it's just too big to manage. Uh, going too small is what we call reductionism, and it's a very bad thing that we still see a lot of in academia. Uh, but uh, going the opposite end and trying to account for absolutely every deviation uh, is just not uh, feasible, especially at this level of learning. So as we talk about Korea, as we talk about Koreans, it's important to note we're talking about 50 million different people, and that's just South Korea. And of course, not everyone's going to fit into uh, the trends and the the through lines that we talk about when we talk about their culture. In the same way, in your home culture, you probably fit a lot of the facets of what's considered your culture, but not everything, right? It's the same idea. So please bear with me as we talk about traditional Korean culture. Uh, this is my background. Um, I was a history major at one point, studying Asian history as well as business administration. Uh, I know, a bad combination if you want to get a job. It should have been the other way around. <laughs> but uh, it did give me a great curiosity about learning about you know, why things are the way they are, which naturally led to me learning a lot about uh, you know, culture in general. Growing up in Okinawa, Japan obviously had a big impact on that as well. So we're going to be talking about Korea's multifaceted belief systems. It's not really fair to say Korea has one specific belief system. Rather, it's more like layers kind of, you know, topped on top of each other. It's a really unique thing that once explained, you'll realize is actually a fairly common human thing. We'll talk about that in a second. Confucianism, education, culture in Korea. As you know, it's impossible to talk about Korea without also talking about Confucianism and its impact on you know, not just Korean culture, but also its education. When we'll talk about Buddhism and art, uh, if you did not know, Buddhism actually accounts for almost a quarter of all South Koreans. Uh, but you wouldn't think it, you know, just because most, you know, Buddhists, they uh, are much more internal about their beliefs, but it has it had a huge impact on all the Korean culture. Uh, Christianity and modernity. Uh, it's kind of the new player on the block, just historically speaking. It's been here the shortest amount of time, but it probably has had the largest amount of recent impact. We're talking uh, since the formation of the uh, Korea as a republic. Shamanism and folk tradition. Believe it or not, shamanism, uh, think, uh, you know, Asia's version of, you know, paganism if you're from Europe, um, actually still has facets that can be seen even in modern day Korea as I'm sure you can point some out in your own culture. So we'll talk about some of those. Hanok and traditional architecture. So we'll be talking about not just Hanok, Korean buildings, but also Hanbok, Korean uh, clothing, and uh, a lot of the tradition that comes with that, and some of the things they're doing to try to update it and modernize it. And we'll end with a little bit about Korean martial arts. So Korea has a very long history. Uh, there's, there's kind of a stereotype that uh, whenever Americans like to go abroad to other countries, we love going to your museums because uh, to an American, you know, written history, America's got like 600 years, right? Most of the people that lived in America thousands of years ago, sadly, they didn't write most of their history down. It's a lot of oral tradition, right? So because of that, whenever we go to a country that has 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years of history, that's really fascinating to us. Uh, so of course, Korea's long history is very fascinating. 
uh, but it does have a certain ramification on its belief systems. It's not a culture uh, that's been able to develop in isolation. Rather, because of their long history and their up and down relationship with Japan and China and Mongolia, Korea's uh, cultural exchange as well as religious exchange is actually very widespread, right? There's no singular uh, Korean culture when it comes to a lot of these belief systems. So rather kind of a system of uh, adoption and adaptation rather than just completely uh, absorbing uh, foreign cultures and religions. Because of this, new belief systems often miss with, mixed with domestic practices. Um, I was actually talking to a colleague the other day, we were you know, talking about my wife. Um, and she, uh, she asked if my wife was Christian as well, and I said yes. And uh, she said, oh, you know, uh, some of the things, some of the stories you told me about her, I thought she was Buddhist. And we kind of came to the realization that in Korea, it doesn't matter what you are, Christian, Buddhist, uh, you know, agnostic, you're a little bit of everything. <laughs> so much of these cultures and belief systems have kind of been stacked on top of each other that it ends up getting absorbed into the general cultural consciousness. As a great example, uh, when my wife tells me not to do something, right? I say, oh, why? And she'll always bring up being reincarnated as a cockroach. Of course, uh, I don't believe in reincarnation, but that doesn't stop her from, just in case, don't do something stupid, you might come back as a cockroach. Like, okay, babe. <laughs> uh, but this isn't completely unique to Korea. In fact, most cultures have gone through this exact same adaptation phase. Um, a lot of you are from Malaysia. Just think about how Islam has been adopted as well as been adapted into that culture, right? When you think about the epicenter of uh, you know, modern Islamic science, right? A lot of it's in Southeast Asia, and a lot of it's been transformed by that culture in the same way that it affected that culture. Um, probably the most famous example for my Europeans, right? Think about, uh, you know, Charlemagne and that whole generation of these uh, Nordic barbaric warriors being converted to Christianity. These Nordic peoples, they, they worshiped lots of gods, but they were all warrior gods, right? The, you know, the goddess of wisdom is also a goddess of warfare. The goddess of fertility, also a goddess of warfare. Everyone's a god of warfare, right? It's just their culture. So when they adapt to Christianity, they're like, okay, Jesus is a warrior god now, to which, uh, you know, Rome was not very happy about, you know, sacrilege. And so they said, oh, you can't paint, paint Christ on your battle shields, right? That's, you know, sacrilegious. You can't do that. And so they compromised and they painted crosses instead. And that became such a big part of this kind of two cultures meeting that even to this day that's used in military awards, it's used in banners, it's even used in national flags in countries like you know, Switzerland and the United Kingdom, right? Um, that was a, a similar thing of these two cultures meeting together and mixing. Modern art, culture, and beliefs reflect these mixtures. Um, so a great example of this is if you go and see Korean art, not just historical art, where you can see this as well, but even Korean contemporary art, you can see a lot of influences from these different belief systems. It's not uncommon to see a, an artist uh, you know, paint something that has you know, very strong you know, religious influences in a Christian direction, to also make a piece of art that has very strong implications in a Buddhist direction or you know, even to you know, shamanistic you know, beliefs and practices. And coming from the same artist, the same person. You go to Im Sedang to buy art and it's not uncommon to see you know, Buddhist art right next to Christian art and vice versa. And you just wouldn't really see that in America, right? You wouldn't really see that kind of mixture of things to kind of you know, keep them separate. Um, so that is uh, something that influences a lot of Korean culture. Uh, like I said, this layering and adaptation is very common. You'll see this not just in belief systems, uh, but you'll see this in other things as well. Think about like Korean pop music or Korean hip hop music. At the beginning, they're just kind of you know, emulating, but nowadays, would you really say K-pop's the same as American pop? No way, right? It's, they've adapted it, they've changed it, they've made it uniquely Korean, but still being influenced by those roots, and I'd argue hip hop as well. In fact, we'll talk a lot about the music scene in a future lecture. I think that's week 13, if 
I'm not mistaken. So let's talk about Confucianism. It's, it's kind of the, the big elephant in the room. So uh, the first thing to talk about is when Confucianism became as big as it did. It technically came during the Goryeo dynasty. We'll talk about Korean history and the different dynasties next week. Uh, but the Goryeo dynasty was the one right before the modern Chosun dynasty, right? And it's actually where we got the name Korea from. Uh, you know, Dutch sailors, they meet this place. Oh, what is this place? Goryeo. Korea, 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 right? <laughs> Uh, you know, as the languages go. Uh, but during this time, it wasn't fully adopted for reasons that are really complex and I'll get into next week. China and Korea during the Goryeo dynasty didn't have a super great relationship because of, you know, just how the dynasty was formed and founded and a lot of the things it was trying to accomplish. And so because of that, they didn't really want to adopt a lot of Confucianism. Instead, what happened was Korean scholars who were sent abroad to study in China actually brought Confucianism back with them. So whenever the Chosen Dynasty uh, became the new ruling power under General Lee, uh, a lot of his friends who helped him in the revolution, they were Confucius scholars who had studied Neo-Confucianism in China. And so that's when Confucianism really took root and took hold in Korea. Now, there is a big debate about how to classify Confucianism. Is it a philosophy? Is it a religion? Oh boy, uh, we get into the semantics of you know, Zen Buddhism, you know, which claims uh, human language is so inadequate at describing reality that uh, obviously reality must be fake. Uh, this is one of those examples. Uh, it technically isn't a philosophy because philosophies don't have the same cultural impact in terms of art and uh, you know, practices and uh, rites the way a religion does. But it's also technically not a religion because it focuses more on this life than you know, the next life or the hereafter. Uh, so because of that, it really just depends on your professor. My background is history and sociology. Because of that, it's just easiest to group it in with religions. Uh, but the moment you say it's a religion, there's going to be at least one person that says, no, it's not, or vice versa. So, you know, now you know why. The, you know, it's, it's got many of the cultural tenets of being a religion, hence why you know, a lot of historians would kind of place it in that bracket. But that being said, people wouldn't claim it as their religion, the way, you know, Christian, Buddhist, or, you know, whatever. They're not going to say, I'm a Confucius, right? It focuses on relationships to others, as well as rites, rituals, and fidelity to family and rulers. So you're probably familiar with Laszlo's hierarchy of needs. Uh, so it's this uh, idea that humans put certain priority on certain needs. So obviously, like your most basic survival needs are the most important to you. But once you get all those taken care of, you start focusing on other types of needs as well. And according to that theory, the top, the peak, where everyone is trying to reach is self-realization, right? That's actually been very controversial in a lot of Asian academic circles. They feel it's very, you know, uh, Anglo, you know, biased and focused, right? Going off a lot of the philosophy, you know, created not just, you know, by the United Kingdom, but also by a lot of German philosophers as well. Very individualistic, very different from uh, Asian values and uh, Eastern ones. Rather, they focus on the idea of social harmony. Uh, for a lot of Asians, especially um, you know, ones that grew up in a very Confucius-focused environment, uh, having harmony within the group, having the group get along together, having the group um, get along without fighting, that is much more desirable than self-realization because that only helps one person versus you know, group harmony, which helps every person. That's the ultimate goal of, you know, any type of safety or security needs, right? Um, but also focuses on rites and rituals. Here's another one uh, that you've probably seen before. You watch a lot of Korean dramas. This is called Jesa, um, ancestral rites, uh, as it's often called. Um, so this is one of those happy coincidences of history, right? Um, you, you think about, like, uh, you know, the, the 
the Communist Party using the color red, and that was able to rally a lot of uh, Chinese peasants during the revolution, um, it was just a happy coincidence. Red was just a lucky color in China already, right? It wasn't because of communism, right? And communism didn't pick it because of Chinese culture. It was a happy coincidence of history. This is another one of those. There was already a shamanistic practice like Jesa in South Korea, or in the Korean Peninsula, rather, uh, before um, Confucianism even came here. It didn't look quite like this, and it was more about worshiping mountains and mountain gods, uh, but having something already in place. And then here comes this new religion that says, hey, you get to, you get to keep this thing that you're already doing. You just have to tweak it, right, and uh, make it fit more to these belief systems uh, that made the pill much easier to swallow. Same with like, you know, the winter solstice and Christmas becoming about, you know, Christ rather than, you know, the death of uh, living things and, and all that in, uh, in Roman culture. Uh, and it focuses a lot on fidelity, faithfulness uh, to family and rulers. So you have to think about Confucius in his own time. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, I recommend uh, reading about him. Fascinating guy. Uh, he had a strong belief that um, being faithful, being loyal to a good ruler, uh, and everyone just kind of following in line like that is how you create harmony. It's how you stop wars. In his time period, China wasn't one place at all. It was a lots of warring places, lots of warlords and warring states. And so he was very interested in finding a way of how do you break that cycle of violence? Well, you have one great ruler and everyone else just kind of, you know, tears down uh, from there. So he spent his whole early life looking for that one great ruler and he never found one. He had a government job, but he thought his boss was kind of corrupt. And so he quit. And instead he started uh, doing a lot of teaching and a lot of his teachings got written down that became, you know, the basis of Confucianism. So it's that goal in mind, that, that very tumultuous, warring period, and him wanting to find a solution of how can we stop the cycle of violence, and believing that faithfulness and fidelity, that hierarchy, that once everyone has a place and everyone fulfills their role properly, then there's not going to be any conflict. Um, because of this, uh, Korean society is often described as extremely hierarchical. Uh, I would agree with that. It's just not as, uh, eh, it's not as definite as it looks on the outside. There's a little bit more flexibility than, than you realize. Um, but every relationship does have a senior and junior. Uh, according to Confucius, the only equals are friends. But I, I would say most Koreans would argue even among friends, there's no perfect equal. There's one friend who's a little bit older, maybe one friend who went to a slightly better school, one friend who's making more money, right? Uh, there's always some kind of hierarchy. There's always a junior or a senior in every relationship. But it's also important to point out that you are not a junior or a senior. You're both to different people. This is something that I think is really hard for a lot of Westerners to grasp. When we see relationship dynamics like that, you just immediately think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm the new guy, I'm the new girl, therefore, I am the lower and everyone else is higher than me. Not necessarily. As soon as someone else comes in, they are now the junior and you are now their senior. And even if you work for the main branch and there's a subsidiary branch to your company, since you work for the main one, you're the senior and they're the junior. It's a constantly evolving process where, you know, even week to week, you are becoming someone else's senior and someone else's junior. It's just a, a constant flow of relationships. Uh, age is an important part of the seniority. So until you have a certain rank or position, age is just a super easy identifier of where you slot into this junior or senior system. Um, I always... <laughs> I always ask my Korean students, what's the first question you, you ask someone when you meet them for the first time? And they always say, oh, I ask for their name. No, you don't. You ask for their age. When you get introduced, someone's already said their name. You ask for their age or you try to ask a question that implies their age. Right? I've been here 11 years and uh, that is a very common question or something they try to assess out really quickly is just, eh, am I higher or am I lower? And there is a very important reason to it, not just this you know, junior-senior system, 
But for those of you who've been studying Korean, it literally changes the way you have to talk to someone, right? If they are your senior, you're supposed to talk to them using different you know, verb endings uh, than if they are your junior, right? So it's a very important question, and I've never met a Korean who has met a fenced by it. Uh, it's just a very practical um, way of gauging you know, how you relate to other people. So if you get the question, I know no one likes to be told, don't be offended. Try your best not to be offended by this question. Uh, if you just don't like giving out your age, um, you know, I got a nice young baby face, and so it's easy for me to kind of get away, you know, uh, we're talking around ages. And um, so I just say, you know, older than you, younger than you, right? And that's normally enough information for them to, that's really what they're looking for exactly, enough information to go off of that. One seniority also creates social obligation. Here's another thing that I think a lot of my Western students have a hard time grasping, just you know, coming from their own home culture. They think if you are the senior, then you are top, right? It's this very like uh, dog eat dog kind of world thing, alpha male kind of thing. If you are the senior and they're the junior, you get all the perks and they get all the crap work, right? But it doesn't work out like that exactly in Confucius cultures. Rather, there's certain obligations you have as a senior and things you have to do as a senior that you could get away with not doing as a junior. As a great example, um, some of you, while you're here, you're going to be invited out to eat, right, with friends. Especially if they are, you know, juniors or seniors and, you know, you're a freshman or you're an exchange student. Don't be surprised if they end up paying for you. And uh, while, of course, you should be thankful, uh, it's important to point out uh, it's an obligation. They're supposed to do that. That's their job as the senior. They're supposed to take care of you. If you need help and you don't get help, it's their fault, right? It's the obligation of being senior, right? When something goes bad in the government, who do they blame? The person who screwed up? Almost never, right? It always goes up to that person's boss, that person's boss's boss, right? Uh, think about General McChrystal, if you're familiar with American uh, you know, uh, politics or the American war in Afghanistan. General McChrystal got canned. Um, he lost his job. Don't feel too bad for him. He teaches now. He's written a book. He's doing fine. But he lost his job for something he didn't even say. It's something his aide said. But that's the way the military works. The person who works for you screwed up, and you have to take responsibility. It's the obligation of seniority, right? Noblesse oblige, if you will. Now, let's go back to Confucius and his time. So everyone's warring. There's lots of warring uh, going on in China. There's not a lot of unity, lots of death and violence. And he wants to put an end to it. So he creates this, this system in his mind of hierarchy and you know, higher and lower relationships, right? Husband and wife, right? You know, husband and wife, um, um, you're right? Uh, king to you know, subordinate, right? Um, as well as you know, certain classes, you know, scholars you know, and soldiers above farmers and peasants and that sort of thing. Um, but that's not going to fix everything. Uh, from his perspective, most wars were happening due to ignorance. Uh, people just not knowing enough about their neighbors, uh, people you know, overestimating uh, what they could get out of a war, and because of that causing war that they should never have gone in the first place. So because of this, uh, the belief that educating yourself would not only help prevent that kind of violence in wars, but more importantly, Education is one of the few things you can do for yourself that has a positive impact to every other person you meet, right? It's a very socially harmonizing thought, right, uh, from his perspective. This idea that as you educate yourself, as you get smarter, as you become more enlightened, not only is that making you a better person, but by your uh, enlightenment by your self uh, improvements, you're also able to help others, and that creates this, you know, cultural good, this universal good for everyone within your social circle. Uh, because education was so important, 
social mobility was tied directly to it. Um, there's a you know, very famous Korean drama about a you know, woman, woman pretending to be a man so she can uh, you know, take the examination. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, this examination is real, right? It's a very big deal. And in fact, it still exists in some form in modern day Korea. Examinations are extremely important, especially, you, especially your university entrance exam. Um, why is it tied to social mobility? It goes back to generally himself. We'll go into a lot more detail when we talk about him specifically in the Chosen Dynasty next week. Uh, but General Lee was born to kind of a middling family. Not super poor, but uh, he wasn't in a position where he should have been a general. Um, just a lot of conflicts and a lot of stuff, plus him just being good at his job, meant he got lucky. He got into a position that technically, according to the social hierarchy of the time, he should never become a uh, general, especially not as high as he got. So when he overthrew the, the, Korean, uh, the Korean emperor and became the new you know, emperor of Korea, uh, he kind of took a lot of this to heart. Hey, the old system is obviously broken. Under the old system, I should never have been a general. I should never have been able to become king. There's something wrong with that system. So when a lot of his Confucius, Neo-Confucius uh, scholar friends started you know, teaching him and you know, telling him about the importance of education and how it's tied to your social status in China at the time, he liked that idea. Like to him, that made a lot more sense. He abolished the slave class and he made it for the first time where you could literally leave your class in Korea based on your examination results. Because of this, it created this huge uh, rags to riches story, where education is the key for going from you know, the bottom to the top. Now, how often does that happen? Uh, I mean, even at that time, like if your dad was a scholar and you know, he learned Chinese, he's gonna teach you Chinese, the exam was done in Chinese, you kind of had an advantage over like the peasant kid next door. Uh, but there was enough people that this was their story. They went from a position of you know, poverty or a lot of ex-slaves eventually rose up to be generals and scholars and people of certain prominence uh, through the education system. And so this rags and riches story is something that holds true even in Korea today, the strong belief that a lot of your future, a lot of your chances for success are in your hands, right? Um, there's a, a level of social mobility uh, in Korean history that didn't exist, right, in the, 1600, or the, sorry, the 1300s and things like that. And so because of that, it's been very ingrained in Koreans that, hey, if you want to succeed, you have to study hard, get good grades, get to a good school, and that's the key to success. And again, even though this isn't something that works for, for everyone realistically, there's enough of these success stories that it still holds a lot of uh, value to a lot of people. But it does create an arms race where everyone strives for the top. If you're unfamiliar with this term arms race, you might have heard it called a security dilemma. It's a phenomenon where when one country feels safe because of something it's done to protect itself, let's say make an aircraft carrier. By that very nature, their neighbors are gonna feel less safe. They're gonna feel threatened. So in response, you know, let's say China makes a aircraft carrier, which they did, right? Uh, Korea feels less safe, so they develop a new missile system. That makes Japan feel less safe, so they develop a new helicopter system. That pisses China off, and it just kind of escalated from there. This is a real thing that happened if you want to uh, just type in China Blue Water Navy, if you want to know the history on that. Uh, but this is a real world thing that happens. But it's not just countries that do that. It's not just a military phenomenon. It's something that happens in culture and society as well. Think about what happens when your kid starts school at two years old, like my niece did. My wife is now constantly paranoid that our son is going to fall behind, right? He started at two and a half years old, right? He's six months behind, right, his, uh, his younger cousin, right? What's going to happen in the future, right? Is she going to pass him, right? Is she going to get a better job than him, right? So... What's the realistic way of dealing with that? Well, when we have our second kid, it's to put him in school at one and a half years old, right? <laughs> and then, of course, when my brother-in-law is their next kid, put him in school at one year old, right? And that sounds crazy. That sounds like you know, no parent would ever do that. 
but putting your kid in school at two was insane just 15 years ago. When my wife was in school a couple decades ago, uh, she went to one Hawk One, one after school education center, uh, and that was for basketball. That was her hobby. Uh, but nowadays, my nephew, who's actually really good at school, he has four Hawk Ones, right? Uh, well, three if you don't count me. I also teach him English. Um, and he's not even struggling at school. That's just average, that's just normal for him. So these yearly exams are taken super seriously in Korea. Um, you only get one shot per year, and this could literally just screw over your chances of getting into a university at all, let alone the university you want. It's taken so seriously that during the hours when most students are driving to school or being taken to school, there's actually a ban on uh, people going into work, right? So if you're here at uh, Gogeek University during this time and you have a morning class, they're just going to cancel it because the professors are not allowed to come into work because that might clog up the streets and make the students late to the exam. It gets even crazier. During the audio, the listening portion of the exam, uh, no airplanes are allowed to fly over the city. They all have to be rerouted. Uh, you're not allowed to test anything like uh, alarm systems or, you know, uh, the military. We had to completely shut down during that time. Uh, like, they take these exams ultra seriously. Again, because of um, this connection between your success, right, social harmony, and education. So, let's talk a bit about Buddhism. Now, if you're... Uh, I don't remember if I said this last week or not, if, and I'm going to say it right now. Uh, ask questions in this class, and one of the main reasons I want you to ask a lot of questions is not only does it make the, the class better, uh, I forgot what was unique and what wasn't about Korean culture because I've been here too long. <laughs> Everything that surprises you or stands out as unique, different, or strange to you also did to me at one point, but it's been so long, I don't remember. A great example of that is this. So when you're walking down the street in Korea, you're gonna see a lot of this symbol. Oh my goodness. It's a Buddhist symbol. Uh, don't think of it any different than say the Christian cross, right, the Islamic crescent. It's just a very commonly used symbol that represents a religion or something from that religious practice. Um, to, why you might associate it with something else, uh, it's to make a long story very short, say what you will about, uh, about Hitler's art. He was a garbage tier historian. And so when a lot of artifacts were dug up in India uh, that had these symbols, he associated that symbol with, you know, Aryans and that sort of thing. Uh, it's not, right? It's a, it was a Hindu symbol. Where does Buddhism come from? Well, the Buddha himself was an Indian prince, right? He came from India. So this symbol just kind of got adapted from that. And, it, and on top of that, it's a super common symbol in a lot of religions. Uh, a lot of this was found in uh, Mesoamerica, right, among uh, American Indian tribes. So, like, uh, when you see this... There's no other way to deal with it except for just to accept that here it means something very different. And, you know, to a quarter of the entire Korean population, this is a very important symbol to them personally. And it's not really fair to tell them to, you know, stop using it at this point. Um, it was introduced, Buddhism itself was actually introduced from China. But in the early years, it was adapted by the elites. So, um, when Buddhism first became uh, a thing in China, it started to spread down a little bit into Korea, but it wasn't really fully adapted. Um, the elites were the first one to accept it. And it's the way that a lot of things go in a culture, right? When the top does it, it kind of you know, trickles down eventually. But when you know, the Korean ruling class were very like you know, confirmed Buddhists, uh, the average Korean peasant even if they adopted Buddhism, they were like half Buddhism, half shaman, right? They didn't really replace shamanism. Rather, they kind of incorporated Buddhism and shamanism into their own belief system together. So because of that, there's still a lot of uh, association between the two. So the Shila dynasty, again, we'll talk about, you know, chronologically the dynasties and all that next week. 
The Shia dynasty was the first Korean state to make it a formal state religion. They actually had a very close relationship with China. China backed them during the, the three uh, warring states period. And so because of that, uh, Shila royalty and leadership uh, adopted a lot of things from China, including you know, some art and stuff like that. So according to legends, so if you've read the chapter, chapter two like you're supposed to before class today, uh, there was the story about when Buddhism was introduced in Korea. Uh, it was introduced, uh, supposedly, the story goes, a monk from China comes to Korea, and he meets the Shila king, and uh, you know, the king is going to put him to death for, um, you know, for preaching about Buddhism. And he says, hey, you can cut off my head, but if you do, I'm going to bleed white instead of red. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. And uh, so, you know, the king's like, whatever. He imprisons him, has him decapitated. And sure enough, he bleeds white instead of red, uh, freaks the king out, and the king kind of converts the country to Buddhism. Well, it's a great story. Kind of mirrors a lot of, you know, Nineveh and, and Jonah and all that. Um, in reality... It might have not been the king that really pushed for Buddhism's uh, adoption in Korea, but rather the queen. So I don't want you to take this as like fact, because this is one of those things where like there's lots of moving pieces in history. Um, but I actually created an art history class with, a, with another professor. She was the art side, I was the history side. We kind of collaborated. It was a, it was a great class. Uh, it's not taught here, it's taught at a different university. Uh, but one thing I learned uh, from her, as well as my research for that class, uh, was that the queen of the Shila dynasty at the time, despite being the most powerful woman in the country, right? Realistically, what does that mean? I mean, you still have to share the spotlight with like a bunch of concubines and, you know, the most powerful woman in the country still doesn't have a lot of power per se. But one place she did have like absolute power was patronage. She could choose what got bought and put in her house, what got bought and you know, put in all the servants' houses. And so the queen took advantage of this and she gave money to things that she really liked, that really spoke to her. So if you're living in this uh, culture where as the top woman in the country, you still don't have a lot of power and influence and you hear about this religion where there is no individual. There is no you. There is no me. We're all just one life force, baby. Uh, that could be really appealing to you, right? Uh, and so the story goes that uh, this really appealed to her personally. And so she started buying a lot of this Buddhist art. And she started treating a lot of the Chinese monks that were coming through very nicely. Uh, and that encouraged even more to keep coming through and selling even more stuff. And of course... Once the scholars and the upper class started seeing the queen do it, they all wanted to do it too, and they kind of just kind of uh, adopted it from there. Uh, the middle path is an important philosophical concept you hear a lot about in Korea. Um, so um, for my Buddhist students, I apologize. I'm, I'm taking a, a much longer story, and I'm kind of condensing it to the highlights. Uh, but uh, the Buddha is sitting under the trees. Not that he hasn't gained enlightenment yet. He's sitting under the tree where eventually he gains enlightenment. And this old woman comes up, and she's got a funeral offering, food, uh, for her dead husband who died and was buried under the tree or by the tree. So she puts the food down, she prays for her dead husband, and she leaves. So the Buddha, he's been there a long time thinking, and he starts to get a little hungry. Should he eat this food? On the one hand, eating the food would be, like, super disrespectful, right? It was given, you know, by this woman for her dead husband. But on the other hand, if he just didn't eat the food at all and he starved to death, would that help anyone? Or it would just create more pain in the world, right? It'd be a net negative, not a positive. So logically, the only thing you could do or should do in that situation is eat half the food. So you hear a lot in Korea, whenever you have like a, you know, two sides in a debate, um, or two extremes you can go into. A, a realistic one recently was nuclear power. Uh, you often hear politicians bring up this idea of, hey, both extremes, they don't sound logical. The middle path is probably the only one we should be taking. Now, if that sounds like the golden, you know, the, the golden path or whatever it is uh, with Socrates, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, this isn't like completely unique to Buddhism, but just having grown up in, you know, Japan and Korea, 
Uh, that's where I've heard it the most is this idea of, you know, the middle path. And it's something that, uh, you know, a, the compromise between two extremes uh, is something you'll see a lot in Korea or something that's discussed a lot in relationships in Korea as well. So another place where Buddhism has uh, strongly impacted Korea, not just as a religion, but as in, you know, the other tenets of religion, is in art, architecture, and technology. So we'll talk about the first one. Like I said, uh, because the queen bought a lot of this art, um, a lot of artists, as well as, you know, Buddhists, you know, carrying this art with them from China, uh, came down and were a huge influence on a lot of the artists in Korea, on what they uh, were drawing and, you know, even uh, art styles and even materials used, a lot of them adopted from China at the time. Um, in fact, some of the oldest surviving artifacts in all of Korea, especially in terms of statues and the like, are, you know, this type of art, right? Um, if you go to the museum, anything about the Shila dynasty, it's going to almost all be focused on, you know, Buddhism and Buddhist art. Um, uh, architecture is another place where it hit. So, um, again, it's really hard to confirm anecdotes like this, but supposedly what happened is a lot of the art that was being brought down from China had depictions of Chinese houses at the time. And so a lot of folks were like, hey, let's, you know, can you build us something like that? And they did, but if you notice, Chinese houses and Korean houses, are, the roof is shaped a little different, and it actually has to do with weather. So Korea is a much rainier and much windier in the summer than in China, and so water was, uh, was getting in and hitting the beams, and there wasn't any way for sunlight to hit them and dry them off, so the beams were rotting right, right at the top where it connects to the roof. Uh, so they actually had to change the architecture slightly, uh, in order to accommodate uh, Korea's weather um, and climate. But that's not the only change that they made to this type of architecture, but it is the reason why, on a superficial level, they actually do look a lot alike. The same is uh, true in Japan as well. And driving technology. So, who invented the first movable type printing press? Normally I have a bunch of students here and there's going to always going to be one that says Gutenberg. And I say, ha, I asked the question really strangely on purpose. I didn't ask for the first metal one. I asked for the first one, period. So the first bamboo uh, printing presses uh, were actually invented here in Korea. And they were actually invented as a way of copying the Buddha Sutras. So actually the oldest remained, remaining printed book um, in, in history is actually a Buddha Sutra. Um, they actually numbered these things. So we know like when it was printed, um, I think it was like 23rd printed or whatever. Uh, and they have it uh, at the Korean National History Museum. So it's one of those things that Korea takes a lot of pride in. Uh, they weren't the first to perfect the technology, but they were the first to you know, come up with it. But they weren't the first to use bamboo. That was the Chinese. They were the first to use you know, movable bamboo print. Yeah. Uh, but in the same way the Gutenberg you know, Bible was a huge influence in driving that technology, the Buddhist sutras here in Korea was a driving force in technology as well. Uh, it fell out of favor during the chosen period to the rise of Neo-Confucianism, but later resurged. Um, so to make a long story super short, uh, by the end of the Goryeo dynasty period, some of the richest people in Korea were monks. And if you know anything about monks, they're supposed to not really own anything, let alone be some of the richest people in the country. Um, basically, what happened was actually not too dissimilar from what happened during the, the Great Schism in Europe. Um, people that should not have gotten into places of power within you know, the religious institution got into power. Um, in the case of... Uh, you know, Europe was the Black Death, right? A lot of reverends were just, you know, uh, ch uh, chaplains, whatever, were just killed off because uh, they were kind of at the front lines of the disease. And so they just kind of went to their B, B tier, C tier, D tier, you know, priests and eventually just got in a lot of people that should not have been in places of power to begin with and it led to a lot of corruption. Same thing happened here where a lot of people got into being a priest, uh, being a monk, sorry, not because of 
you know, devotion to the faith, but because they could have a stable, you know, income from it at a time where that's not necessarily true for every profession. And eventually they just accumulated more and more and more wealth and became seen as a symbol of corruption. So the Neo-Confucius scholars took advantage of this. When they kind of came to power with General Lee at the start of the Chosen Dynasty, they were like, hey, you know those, those Buddhist monks that are exploiting you and don't practice what they preach? We're going to get rid of them. There wasn't a lot of persecution per se. If you were in like the, the royal court, if you were in the upper echelons of society, then they kind of purged you of you know, being able to practice Buddhism openly. But for most Korean peasants, again, it was another layering, another adaptation. You know, they didn't, Buddhism never really left them per se. This kind of put Confucianism on top of it. The monks themselves kind of got pushed out to the mountains and you know, up to their, their temples. Uh, but what ended up happening was a Mongolian invasion um, and then eventually a Japanese invasion, uh, which was much more important. So in your mind, when you think of uh, monks, you think of very pacifistic, nonviolent people, uh, I will say uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of what you might think about Buddhism has been reinterpreted through the lens of the New Age movement, which uh, was a, a big thing in the 60s uh, in, in Western countries. Um, and they kind of adopted, adapted, reinterpreted a lot of Buddhist things through that. At the time, in like real world Buddhism, um, physical discipline, right? Martial arts was a way of separating yourself from this, uh, this idea of self, right? Kind of uh, separating you from you know, the, the falseness of this world. And so most of these monks were very well-trained in fighting. They didn't fight anyone. They were just well-trained in it as part of their discipline. So when you know, Japan invaded, uh, their navy you know, got defeated, but their, their army was gigantic, and there wasn't enough Korean troops to push them back. And here come these monks down from the mountains fighting in this war, and this created this sense of Buddhists being very patriotic and being very pro-Korea. Um, so because of that, Buddhism was kind of like re-brought uh, back into the upper echelons of, of Korean society. And even though they were still mostly Confucianism first, those layers uh, were allowed back in. It's the second largest uh, religion in modern Korea, right after Christianity. Um, but that being said, uh, you won't be able to spot a Buddhist who isn't a monk just by the way they dress or the way they act. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to put it. So, do Buddhists eat meat? I know your first impression, your first knee-jerk reaction is to say no, and that's because, again, you're, you're thinking about the Western reinterpretation of it. Monks can't eat meat. Uh, Buddhists can eat whatever the heck they want. Uh, are Buddhists allowed to drink? And again, your inclination is to say no, but it's monks that, aren't, uh, that are forbade from drinking. If you're just like the average you know, Korean businessman who happens to be Buddhist, you drink like a fish, you eat meat every night. It's, you know, you're Korean, right? Uh, in the same way that Korea has adapted a lot of other things, um, Buddhism itself was also adapted in Korea. So when you see the average Buddhist in Korea, he just looks like a regular guy. She just looks like a regular girl. Like they just, um, they're very just outwardly Korean. It's often just, you know, when the holidays come around, Buddha's birthday is a big holiday in Korea. And everyone celebrates it, but everyone celebrates it a little differently. And that's when you'll come out, oh, you're, you're Buddhist. Okay, cool. I just didn't know, right? Uh, also contributed greatly to Korea's view of alms and reincarnation. So we have to go into the weeds here in a bit. And I apologize again to any of my Buddhist students in the classroom. I'm going to take something very large and condense it down. Uh, when you think of like major through lines of religions, like what is, like what is this religion about, right? You know, redemption in Christianity or sanctification in, you know, Judaism or Islam. Uh, the key word to keep in mind with Buddhism is, Anatman. 
So if you're not familiar with, with what this is, Atman comes from Hinduism. It's the belief of the true self. In Hinduism, you are not you. You're multiple reincarnations deep of a former god or goddess. And so a big part of Hinduism is trying to separate what you think is you from the actual true self, the Atman. An Atman means no Atman. It's a Buddhist belief that there is no true self. There is no self. There isn't you. There isn't me, right? Uh, there are no individuals, right? There's no my. There's, you know, it's just one life force. And it's people thinking that they're individuals, thinking they have wants and needs and preferences that creates problems and pain and strife uh, you know, in this life. And the only way you can end the cycle is to completely separate yourself from the idea of yourself. If it sounds complicated, it's because I'm trying to condense a lot of it. Um, but think about it from a practical standpoint. If you're a monk, you can devote a lot of time uh, to the practice of separating yourself from the idea of, you know, of self, you know, finding that anatman, if you will, gaining enlightenment. But if you're the average peasant, if you just gave up all your possessions, would that cause more pain or less pain? Probably a lot more pain, not only for yourself, but for your family, right? And so because of that, there had to be a practical way of allowing the average person to practice separating themselves from the idea of self without uh, hurting others in the process. And so alms was their solution. Now, if you're not sure what alms are, uh, I'm sure you probably know them better as the word tithe. Um, it's the idea of giving money for religious purposes, right? So every religion has a different view on alms and on tithes, right? Um, so, for instance, in Islam, it's, it's one of the five tenets, right? Um, so in Buddhism, alms, uh, giving to the poor, normally giving to monks, that was, at one point in time, that was their only way of uh, subsistence, was uh, you know, through begging. Uh, they are actually providing a favor to you, right? If you're a good Buddhist, but you can't just dedicate your life to being a monk, and you have a family to take care of, this is a way for you to separate yourself from your idea of self, to give up something, to sacrifice something, right? To end uh, suffering in others because ultimately there is no others, right? You're helping yourself by helping others because there is no others, there's no self, there's only uh, you know, one life force, right? So any good, any amount of pain reduced is a positive for you. Know, you. Uh, so because of this, in Korea to this day, People will hit you up for money all the time, right? Whether it's religious institutions or far more likely these days is Oxfarm and UNICEF. People will hit you up for money all the time, right? By the four-way over here, I get stopped all the time and ask for money. From their perspective, they're not bothering you. They're giving you a service, right? Um, please try to keep that in mind. Please don't be rude Right? A lot of them standing out here in the cold or in the heat. You know, it's not like they're having fun out here doing this. Uh, they're used to people just kind of smiling, nodding, and walking. You don't have to give, but you don't have to be a jerk either. I, there was one professor here. She had a really hard time coming to grips with that. She just was really rude to a lot of these folks, especially if they were religious. And all that did was create more problems for her, right? Just... It, I know no one likes to be told to change. No one likes to be told don't be offended, but try to adapt a little bit, right? Just smile, nod, keep walking. That'll, that'll be perfectly fine. And if you want to give, by all means, give, right? Reincarnation. So I talked a bit about that previously. But what happens if you can't separate yourself from self? What happens if you've done so much bad in this life, right, that you are forced to live it again, right? Well, that's reincarnation, right? You kind of go back into the wheel of reincarnation and you're going to you know, come back as something else. If you had a good life, you're going to come back as something good, right? Um, especially in Buddhism, uh, dogs are thought fairly highly of. Um, you know, coming back as a dog, you're probably going to be treated a lot nicer than if you came back as you know, a chicken. If you come back as a chicken in Korea, you are doomed. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's the idea there. 
Another important facet here, when we talked about like, you know, cultural adaptations, what's karma? <laughs> if I say karma, if you're from a Western country, almost assuredly you're thinking, oh, you know, what goes around comes around, right? Uh, no, karma has to do with reincarnation, it has to do with, you know, what you come back is. You don't get punished or rewarded until the end of your life, right? In the Western culture, we kind of adopted it to, you know, getting your, your just desserts now in this life, right? We want our, we want our rewards now. We wanted our enemies punished now. Uh, so it's another one of those reinterpretations, you know, culture change religions, the same way religions change culture. It's a lot of back and forth, right? All right, Christianity and modernity. So uh, it first came to Korea in the form of Catholicism, uh, brought back by Koreans living abroad during the late Chosen Dynasty. Ironically, it wasn't Koreans in Western countries, because there are very, very, very few Koreans in Western countries in the 1800s. Uh, instead, they were in China. There's actually a sizable Catholic population in China at the time, the Jesuits. So uh, some of these um, Catholics came back into Korea, and they never got super big, right? They were you know, the royalty never adopted it, so it never did that trickle-down effect. So they were just kind of like their own, like, you know, isolated little group. Um, but again, there isn't, like, a big history of religious persecution in Korea. So the Korean government just kind of left them alone to their own devices. Uh, but what ended up happening is they got big enough that they actually had their own bishops. And so the Korean bishop is writing to his Chinese counterpart, and he's talking about, hey, you know... Korea, it's a lot smaller than China. Like in theory, like China could be conquered pretty easily. Uh, the queen of Korea, out of all people, ended up intercepting this letter and took it as a threat. And so she abolished Catholicism and just completely, um, you know, tried to get rid of the religion and any practitioners completely. So because of this, even to this day, despite Catholics actually being pretty sizable, we're talking like 3 million right, 3 million out of 50 million people, it's still a huge chunk of people, you never will know if someone's Catholic until they say it. Catholics, by nature in Korea, tend to be really quiet about being Catholic. In fact, Korea just had its first Catholic president, right, Moon Jae-in's Catholic, and half of the people that voted for him didn't even know until he gets elected and he goes to Mass and they're like, oh, he's Catholic. Okay, cool, I didn't know that, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's how, you know, I don't want to say hush-hush, right? Uh, you know, they live their faith, but they're, uh, they're not out there saying, hey, I'm Catholic, right? It most likely dates back to this, you know, persecution era. Uh, Protestant missionaries actually had much more success in Korea uh, thanks to their association with schools and hospitals and that sort of thing. There's a lot of schools in Korea University that were started by Christian missionaries, right? You think like Yonsei University, like the third highest ranked university in the country. Uh, you know, um, Sungo University, which is, you know, my university as well. Um, even, uh, you know, Pyeongtaek University is, as well. Uh, lot, there's lots of them. Sogong University was actually started by the Jesuits. So when a lot of these Christian missionaries came over, there was another happy coincidence. <laughs> so let's call it benevolent racism. <laughs> they accidentally did something good, even if it, the reason they did it is kind of sketchy. So they come to Korea, and they're like, wow, Korea, all of their technology is so old. Their buildings are so old. They must not have enough schools. No, Korea had plenty of schools, right? They were super focused on schools and education. But because of that impression, uh, a lot of Christian missionaries, when they came over here, that's how they witnessed. They would build schools, right? And they would build hospitals and things like that. Uh, and they'd use that as an avenue to, you know, to, you know, popularize to others. And when Koreans saw this, they were like, hey, these guys aren't too bad. Like, they come into our country and they want to build schools. They come over here and they want to build hospitals. These guys are pretty nice. So even though their numbers weren't super huge in the early years, they kind of got that reputation as, you know, hey, they care about the things we care about. They might believe something different from us, but some of their key values, you know, were, were, were on point with each other. So they had a, a pretty okay reputation in the early years. 
So what really sparked Christianity off in Korea was its association with patriotism. And if you remember what happened with Buddhism, it was during the Japanese invasion in the 1500s. Um, and because the Buddhists fought against the Japanese, they kind of got associated with being patriotic and pro-Korea, right? In the same way, whenever Korea was annexed, we'll talk a lot about Korean, Korea's annexation by Japan next week when we talk about Korean history. Uh, during this period, um, despite there not being a whole lot of you know, freedom fighters, right? They were a relatively small number. Most of them were people who were educated abroad. There wasn't a lot of those people at the time. Um, despite Christians making up, gosh, one and a half, two percent of the country at the time, they made up something like 40 percent of the freedom fighters in Korea, mostly because a lot of them were educated in places like America, including this gentleman here. We'll talk a lot more about on next time. Uh, but to kind of put things in perspective, uh, this is the, the person who killed the Japanese governing general in Korea in uh, 1910. And so when he was put on trial, he refused to answer to his Japanese name. He refused to answer to his Korean name. He would only respond to his Christian name of Thomas. Now, he likely did this to, to piss off the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Japanese that were, that were you know, sentencing him to death. Uh, but the knock-on effect was this idea of, oh man, the Christians are the ones fighting against the Japanese, the ones fighting for our independence. Uh, you know, they're, they're the good guys, right? In the same way, you know, uh, communists uh, got associated with being patriotic and pro-Korean in the north. Uh, in the south, it was Christian. Actually, all right, we're kind of getting the weeds here. It's kind of reverse, actually. The, the, the Christian stronghold was actually in the north of Korea, and the communist uh, stronghold was actually in, in the south, but once they got divided by Russia and the U.S., the people kind of migrated. Um, you know, fun fact. <laughs> uh, but something else that stands out about Christianity in Korea, probably because it's such a it's a large enough size, you're going to have a lot of diversity in thought. Um, they're they're not associated with any one political party or spectrum. Part of that is just there's so many Korean political parties. There was 15 in the last election, for instance. But another facet, like I said, there's so many of them uh, and so many different shades of you know, Christianity in Korea. They are uh, not all thinking the exact same way about things, especially in politics. So in the book, it gave like, the anecdote of uh, the party being associated with uh, you know, the, uh, the conservative politics. That's because of when the book was written. I originally wrote it in 2012, published 2014. Um, that was uh, the Park Goon Hae era, right? Uh, it gives the anecdote in the book of, you know, the mayor of Seoul uh, being accused of being in leagues with the devil. Uh, that's my old boss. <laughs> uh, I don't think he was in leagues with the devil, but he does spend much more money than he should. <laughs> Long story. Uh, but anyway, uh, um, the reality in Korea is every election, different groups will galvanize around different politicians and around different parties. There isn't like a consistent uh, you know, performance of, oh, this group's going to go here, this group's going to go there. A great, for instance, of this is actually the head uh, Buddhist uh, monk in Korea. You can call him the Dalai Lama of Korea, but he really doesn't like being called that. Um, he uh, actually endorsed the... Uh, the Green Party, not the actual, there's a party in Korea called the Green Party, not that party, but the Independent Party um, during the 2012 election. And that was huge news um, because there is the thought that, oh, okay, a lot of Buddhists are then going to vote that way. Ultimately did it for very complicated reasons. Uh, but it is something to keep in mind that uh, all sides, I say both here because you think left and right, you know, if you're Western, uh, but all sides of the political spectrum, up, down, left, right, center, um, have their own different religious support bases, and they're very malleable, right? People aren't as diametrically opposed in Korea yet as they might be, like, say, in America, right? Um, Koreans tend to uh, flow a lot more in their politics. It's also a large facet of Koreans abroad. If you live in a country that has like a Korea town or a sizable Korea population, you probably notice they all go to the same church. <laughs> uh, I had a Korean American buddy 
Um, he was born in Korea, but he was raised in the States. Like he's you know, 100% American, culturally speaking. Uh, and when they, he, was, he was meeting a, a Korean friend of mine, and uh, another Korean friend of mine. And uh, they asked him, oh, which church do you go to? And he said which one it was. And they're like, oh, that's not a Korean church. He's like, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm in America, I'm American, I'm going to go to an American church. Uh, you know, I don't have to go to a Korean one. Uh, but for a lot of Koreans abroad, that's where they can go and, you know, meet people like themselves. That's where they can go and have their, their potlucks, right? Where they can get food that reminds them of back home. That's where they can go and socialize and get their, you know, bootleg Korean drama DVDs and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of these little pockets of these little Korean communities outside of every army base in the U.S. You know, the old adage, you know, uh, soldier comes over here single, falls in love, gets married, brings them back to the States, uh, and has little half-Korean babies. And so because of that, there's actually sizable Korean populations outside of most army bases. Uh, and all of them, you're, right, you're going to find a Korean mart, a Korean restaurant, and a uh, Korean church. Right? And they all kind of congregate and spend time together. In the same way, if you spend enough time here in Korea, you're going to have your own little congregation, your own little hangouts. Uh, again, for a lot of my Malaysian students, as there's so many of you at this point, um, the ones that are here for the full four years or even longer, um, ask them about the hangout spots, right? They'll, they'll let you know all the great places, not just to eat, but to, you know, to, go to, to go to mosque and things like that, spend time with, you know, when you want to get a taste of home. Shamanism! So, um, shamanism actually resembles a lot of the nature-worshipping, paganistic religions of a lot of other places in the world. Um, what makes Korean shamanism unique in that sense is uh, it's not just animals. Animals are a huge part of Korean shamanism. Lots of cranes and tigers and things like that in shamanistic art and clothing. Uh, but it actually predates that as well. Uh, in Korea shamanism had a lot of focus on mountains. Now, I know right here on Gungu campus, it doesn't feel hilly. It doesn't feel mountainous. It feels very flat, right? Uh, most of Korea is actually not flat. It's like 70% mountainous. Uh, mountains everywhere in Korea. So because of that, uh, mountains and mountain spirits and mountain gods played a very big role in Korean shamanism. It's kind of it's a little, little thing that kind of separates from other similar shamanistic traditions. It's also predominantly matriarchal. So I don't want to go too far in the weeds here. Uh, you know, some schools of thought that are also maybe a little too reductionist, right, uh, like to believe that shamanistic religions uh, have always been, you know, patriarchal, and not matriarchal, but almost all archaeological evidence we can find shows most shamanistic religions and most people at one point in history were more matriarchal. And from a, a nature spirit worshiping perspective, it kind of makes some sense. Like, sorry guys, we're, we're a lot more expendable <laughs> than women are in this whole like keeping our species alive process. So when you think about the people that just by nature are going to be associated with nature itself, with life, with longevity, uh, women uh, have a lot more to offer than their male counterparts. Uh, so because of that in Korea, as well as a lot of pagan religions, like you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, uh, had a very matriarchal bent to them. Um, even in modern-day Korea, over 90% of shamans are women. Uh, you're not going to uh, see too many male shamans. A lot of that has to do with how a shaman gets picked. So it actually reminds me of the Sunni and Shia split uh, for my Islamic students. So uh, half of the shamans in Korea, uh, they were born into it. So your mother was a shaman, right? Yeah, you're kind of a shaman too now, right? She's going to train you. You're going to follow in her footsteps. Uh, but the other half have what they call a shaman dream, where they get kind of the calling to become a shaman, right? And you had this dream as a little girl, 
and you get taken to you know these shaman uh, groups, and they kind of train her at a very young age to kind of you know take on the responsibilities. Um, so the total amount of like Koreans who associate themselves as shaman, like we're right down as a religion, you know, Korean shamanism, extremely small amount. It's mostly the priestesses themselves, and that's kind of it for the most part. Rather, what ends up happening is shamanism is a facet of other religions in Korea. So you're Buddhist, but you also adhere to some shamanistic practices. You're Christian, but you still adhere to some shamanistic practices, right? Um, but uh, if you're talking about its greater cultural impact, like a thing that is undeniably still a piece of, of all the Korean culture, it is uh, music, dancing, and drinking. So uh, for my Chinese students, you probably you know, learned in your history class at one point, uh, when China was uh, establishing relations with other countries, um, they often had names for them that were very literal, like very descriptive names. Oh, this is the, this is the place of rice, right? So we're going to call it the rice place. <laughs> um, so the name for Korea, or one of the first names for Korea given to them by China, roughly translates out to the kingdom of people who wear white and love singing and dancing. <laughs> Uh, th that was what stood out to Chinese uh, traders and, and uh, explorers when they first met Koreans. Yeah, they like to wear white clothes and they're always drinking and singing and dancing. Okay. And you think about modern Koreans, that's not too far off from how modern Koreans like to relax and how they like to enjoy themselves or express themselves, right? So, you know, even nowadays, you go to Noribang, right? You're going to see a lot of singing and drinking and dancing. You watch a lot of Korean TV, you'll see a lot of singing, drinking, and dancing. And that's regardless of religion. Um, many of the practices have been incorporated into other religions and popular culture. Uh, like I said before, um, there's not a lot of strict uh, shamans. Uh, rather, there's little pieces of shamanism that get passed around. Uh, palm reading is a, is a big one. So if you go here to the, you know, to the side of the road where they're selling like the chicken on a stick and everything, you're also going to find plenty of places that will you know, read your palms, right? That's carrying over from shamanism. Uh, they're supposed to be able to predict your future, especially about relationships. So it's actually a common thing for couples to do together is to go to a shaman, regardless of your uh, religious uh, affiliation. Uh, but most Koreans see it as a form of entertainment rather than like actually strictly appear to that, right? So it really just you know depends person to person. Um, do, 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 do. But if you notice, if you've ever been to getting your palm read or whatever, uh, what do they use? Do they use some kind of special ancient Korean tablets or ancient Korean dice or ancient Korean? No, it's tarot cards. It's straight up French tarot cards. Yeah. So even for shamanism, they've kind of adopted and adapted in modern day Korea as well. Uh, my personal favorite examples of, the, uh, of Korean shamanism that's still relevant in modern day Korea is Taemong, Fan Death, and Doppelganger Mice. Okay, so what's the Taemong? It's a pregnancy dream. So it's the belief that uh, a woman can have a dream that predicts when someone she's close to has become pregnant. Now, it's not her. You don't have your own Taemong. You have your pregnancy a dream about other women, right? So like your sister or your best friend, right? Uh, you have a dream about them being pregnant. Uh, from what I could research, there's another country that does this. It's, it's certain parts of Italy has their own version of this as well. Um, but what little bit of scientific research has been done on this uh, actually says there might be something to this, but it's not what you're thinking. Rather, it likely has to do with the fact that we're observant of other people, uh, women even much more so. And so when you see your best friend suddenly change what shampoo she's using, and she's changing what soap she's using, and she's changing what the food she eats, subconsciously you're thinking, that's kind of weird, I wonder why she's doing that. Uh, but you're not really like putting two and two together. And then in your dream, it's just firing random neurons. And it fires on that neuron of, 
she might be pregnant, you dummy. And so you combine that with, you know, a random dream about something else, you know, that's, you know, might be where, you know, this Taemung thing comes from. So the idea is what is in the pregnancy dream predicts what gender the child is going to be. So my son, um, you know, is a boy. The Taemung that predicted my son's birth. Yeah, my, 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 my wife's uncle's wife actually had the Taemung about my wife being pregnant. And then it was two strawberries. It was supposed to be twin girls. <laughs> Obviously, my son is not a twin girl. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, uh, over one, I guess. Uh, but my wife act accurately predicted when her sister was pregnant, right? So, yeah, at least for most Koreans, it's at least a fun thing to do, even if they don't believe it 100%. Uh, but common symbols for males, like tiger is a very common male symbol. That's going to be a son. And peach is a very common women's symbol. Um, Koreans believe uh, peach looks like a woman's cleavage, so it's often associated with women. Uh, take that as you will. Uh, fan death is another great one. So, if you've never heard of Korean fan death before, uh, it's this belief that uh, in Korea, that if you go to bed and you leave a fan on, like an oscillating fan, if you leave it on and on your face when you go to bed, it's going to kill you. So on Korean fans, they actually all have timers built into the fan. So you don't go to bed with it on. You go to bed with it set to like, you know, one hour, two hour, whatever. And it shuts off, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it shuts off automatically. Uh, so where does this idea of fan death come from? So there's two schools of thought, and then maybe like a third kind of combining them if you want to look at it this way. The first is, it comes not from fans first, but it comes from candles. So if you're going to bed, you have to blow the candle out before you go to bed, otherwise it will kill you. Most likely because it was catching things on fire and you know, suffocating you through smoke or burning stuff down. Uh, so be Koreans became very obsessed with blowing up candles before you go to bed. Um, and then that just kind of, you know, the 21st century just kind of like evolved into fans being another version of that. Uh, you know, it's association with electricity in the same way lights are associated with electricity and lights are associated with candles. Uh, the other theory has to do with pneumonia. So Korean summers are super, super, super wet. You sweat so much and you got all this sweat just caked onto your body. And then if you go to bed and you leave that fan on, what ends up happening is your core temperature starts to drop a little bit. And for the average healthy adult, that's probably not going to do anything bad. But for a child or an elderly person, it might kill them. So that's one theory where this came from was people going to bed with fans on, them ended up catching pneumonia and they died. And so they blamed it on the fan. Uh, the other one is mice doppelgangers. This one's a fun one. So uh, I bite my nails when I get nervous. It's a bad habit. Don't do it. Uh, but... Uh, whenever I do it in front of my wife, she gets super angry and makes sure that I count all my fingernail clippings, gather them together, and throw them out. Um, it's not just because she's a clean person, which she is. It's because in Korea, it's believed that if mice eat your fingernail clippings or your toenail clippings, they'll turn into an evil doppelganger and try to replace you. Uh, where does this come from? I have no idea. And everything I could do to research it uh, doesn't have a great answer. It most likely was just a, a way of convincing children to be more hygienic. All right, religious holidays in Korea. So uh, you might be surprised to hear that most holidays in Korea that are strictly enforced, like government holidays, very few of them are religious holidays. Most of them are you know, associated with, uh, you know, other things, Armed Forces Day, right, President's Day, Labor Day, things like that. Uh, Buddhism, shamanism, and, Christ and Christianity do all have religions that all, all are observed in Korea, but I would argue the Buddhist one and then, you know, the Confucius one that you can say, you know, kind of evolved from the shamanism one are the only ones that are like, taken super seriously and you do something like very specifically religious on those holidays. Um, 
So the, the, the Buddhist ones, uh, Buddhist birthday being the, the big one, or the, the day Buddha ascended is the you know, English translation of the name in Korean. Uh, that one is a day for, if you're not Buddhist, um, you, know, you still might visit a shrine or something like that, you know, show your respects. Uh, but Buddhists themselves take it pretty seriously. Um, but the shamanistic holidays kind of got absorbed into the Confucius ones. So Solal, which is like the Lunar New Year, you know, Chinese New Year, if you want to call it that. And the uh, Chuseok, which is kind of Korea's Thanksgiving holidays. Those are the big used-to-be shaman holidays that are now just 100% associated with Confucianism rather than shamanism. And Christian holidays are the ones I find most interesting. Despite Christianity being the largest religion in Korea, uh, they're not treated as religious holidays. Like, Easter isn't a day off in Korea. I mean, Easter falls on a Sunday, but like, you know, you go to church on Sunday like you do every Sunday. Like, there's nothing special there. And then uh, on Christmas, you actually spend Christmas... As a, it's a couple's holiday. Like Christmas is more about gifts for children and dates for couples. It's not considered necessarily a religious thing. It's a really uh, interesting take, an uh, interesting adaptation of the holiday. Uh, other religions in Korea? So, like I said previously, long-term religious conflict in Korea doesn't really exist or hasn't really existed historically. So... Because there wasn't a lot of fighting and like, you know, uh, you know killing over it, uh, most religions in Korea, Koreans just kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they don't persecute, but they don't like do anything special for you either, right? They're not going to make special accommodations for you and feel like, oh, because of our bad history, we're going to, you know, try to, you know, mend, you know, things. There's none of that because there is none of that bad history, or very little of it. Um, so Koreans just kind of like, they're not going to persecute you, but they're not going to do anything special for you either. They're just kind of like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. Um, so for instance, uh, probably the fastest growing religion in just terms of like numbers of new people coming in uh, is Islam. A lot of folks from not just the Middle East, uh, we, got, you know, we got professors here, doctors here from Iran, for instance, uh, but also uh, a lot of folks from uh, Southeast Asia as well coming here just for school or for work or for a lot of them, you know, to, to live here, right, the rest of their lives. So there is a huge increase in um, Islamic personnel in Korea, but mathematically speaking, it's still like, you know, fractions smaller than other religious sects. So the culture really hasn't adapted to it. Rather, it has been trying to adapt to the culture. So you can find mosques that look like mosques. They're extremely rare, though. Most mosques in Korea look like, well, they look like Korean buildings. I actually used to work by one of the largest mosques in Korea, in Gangnam, and it's just a gray building, <laughs> right? It just looks like every other gray building in Korea because just like the, 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 the geographic realities of you know, we can't really make architecture that, you know, reminds us of what we could make, you know, back in our, our home countries. So it's a, a, you know, trying to adopt to it instead. Uh, accommodations are increasing, uh, but they're still fairly uncommon. So probably the, the first one that stood out to me personally was when I went to Lotte World. If you haven't been to Lotte World before, it's kind of like Korean Disney World, I guess. Uh, so you go to Lotte World, and they have prayer rooms, like... It, it, in case you just have no familiarity with the Islamic faith, prayer is another one of those five tenets. And so you're supposed to pray at certain times every day facing Mecca. And it can be a pain in the butt sometimes for, you know, if you're, uh, if you're working or if you're on vacation, you have to keep in mind all the time, you know, what direction Mecca is. You have to keep a watch on you. It can kind of be hard to go and have, make a day out of an activity unless you just kind of plan everything ahead of time. Uh, so having a prayer room is just super convenient because then you can just go there, uh, you know, take care of your business, and then continue on with your day. But I, you don't see a lot of prayer rooms. I've never seen a prayer room at Disney World, right? Just You don't see a lot of that um, in other places outside of, like, the Middle East. So having one at Loti World in Korea is really fascinating to me. And I asked some of the workers there who are from Malaysia, and they said, 
Uh, at first, uh, we asked for them, like, so the workers. So it just made it really convenient, a private place that the, the workforce there, a lot of them were volunteers or part-time workers. Uh, not volunteers, like part-time workers, yeah. Um, and so they didn't have to leave and go do it. They could just kind of, you know, stay on the premises and just kind of do it during, uh, you know, take their breaks during that time. Uh, but they realized that for tourists, that's super convenient. Just knowing, oh, there's a prayer room here. I can spend several hours here, my whole day here, and I don't have to worry about it, you know, is really nice. Uh, so you do see more of that increasing in Korea, right? They got, you know, the airport as well. Um, uh, another area is in cuisine. So, like I said, Korea kind of has the attitude of not persecuting, but not accommodating either, right? If you're in Korea, you know, and you don't want to do Korean things, you just kind of have to take care of yourself. Uh, dietary restrictions is, is a, a good example of that. Only about 1% of Korea is vegetarian, and vegans make up a fraction of that. So you can imagine the difficulty for halal or, you know, uh, kosher meals, right? Um, but from my understanding, they know there's a demand for it. They know there's a market for it. So, you know, people are trying to make at least some efforts uh, in order to accommodate that as well. It's just not going to be everyone, right? Um, actually, talk to some of your senior students if you have dietary restrictions. Uh, I was talking to some students earlier uh, engineering students, uh, they said there was an app you could use. You could type in, it told you like nearby halal restaurants and even had like the ingredients listed out and, uh, you know, prices and translations of all the names in different languages. You know, there is some, you know, effort going on, but it's not going to be like, you know, a whole culture widespread thing. Um, so you're going to have to put in a little bit of effort, uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be just fine. Uh, but, uh, they do have halal and kosher sections in most e-marts nowadays. So if you want to do your home cooking, you can get some of your key ingredients uh, from, you know, your, your local uh, grocery store. Hanbok and traditional dress. Uh, that is me in my home book. Yes, I own a hanbok, and that is my wife and hers. So let's go ahead and uh, address the proverbial elephant in the room if you're from a Western country, especially not the, you know, single anyone out, but let's say America, you might have certain ideas, thoughts, or expectations, or hang-ups even, about wearing clothing that's not from your culture. Um, uh, that concept just does not exist in Korea at all. You'll find it does not exist in most countries in the world. Uh, America is kind of being uh, its own little weird outlier. Most Koreans, they do not mind that you're wearing hanbok. They love and appreciate the fact that you love and appreciate something from their culture. And they're going to wear stuff from your culture all the time. Uh, no one's going to get pissy about it. Uh, so do keep that in mind. If you want to rent a hanbok, right, if you want to, you know, rent one and go walk around Gimpa Palace, no one's going to look dirty at you. If anything, people are going to, you know, smile, take pictures, or whatever. So hanbok, literally han meaning hanguk, Korea, and bok meaning clothing, uh, is literally Korean clothing, Korean dress. Um, you're not going to see a lot of people walking around wearing hanboks these days. There's a, a lot of reasons for that. Um, but basically, hanboks are super expensive. Uh, for my wife's hanbok plus accessories and my hanbok plus accessories, I think it came out to a little over two grand. And keep in mind, my entire wedding was about three grand. So uh, the hanboks uh, alone were, was cost almost as much as my entire wedding. Uh, they're very expensive because a lot of times if you want a nice one, you have to get it, you know, handmade. And there are lots of shops that can get them handmade for you and you can pick out colors and material. And it's really nice, but they are very pricey. Instead, where you're most likely to see hanboks is not just, you know, at touristy places, people renting them. Uh, during holidays, uh, children often wear hanboks. My niece uh, had a hanbok that she wore all the way up until she was about 13 um, she doesn't wear one anymore, uh, but 
we're going we're gonna to buy her another one when she graduates, right? That's a pretty common thing. Think of uh, coming of age day in Japan, right? You're supposed to get a really nice yukata for that. Same idea. Um, couples for wedding photos, right? Like my wife and I did. That being said, since they're so expensive, there has been kind of a shift in a lot of Korean couples, not quite a majority, but probably within the next decade or so a majority, of Koreans rent their hanboks for the wedding photos instead of buy them. I've worn mine once and only once. I'd like to wear it again. I'd like to do another picture with it, especially since my son just got a hanbok made, uh, you know, less, uh, less chuseok. So having a, one with all three of us would be really cute. Uh, but if you're a male, you're not going to have a lot of opportunities to wear it. Uh, women, on the other hand, do have a few more opportunities. If you go to a Korean wedding, it's not uncommon for bride and groom's mothers to wear hanbok. And it's also not uncommon uh, to see it at places like graduations and things like that. Uh, so women do get a lot more utility out of their hanboks, but it's mostly doing mom things. Uh, modern interpretations are being introduced. So uh, I don't do a lot with the... Um, with the uh, art and design college here anymore, but there was a point in time where there was a lot of uh, cross uh, between my department and their department. And so I got to talk with a lot of the professors there and work with them. And it seems like the holy grail in Korea, if you are into fashion, if you're into design, fashion design, if you're into art, like the holy grail is coming up with a modern cost-effective, but still flattering hanbok. So uh, do I have any Vietnamese students? Normally I ask that, there's always at least one Vietnamese student, and I can point them out, and I can say, hey, do women in your country still wear traditional Vietnamese dresses? And sometimes they're even wearing one when I ask that question, and they're like, yeah, we do. I'm like, yeah. So Vietnam is the example that's always used. Vietnam was able to modernize the dress using... Uh, very cost-effective fabrics and techniques. It looks cute. It's still very form-flattering, but not you know too revealing. So it's great to wear just on everyday stuff, or you know um, if you're on a low-key date, stuff like that, or even to work. You'll see a lot of women wear it, and it costs you know not too much more than what you would pay for any other clothing. Uh, in the case of uh, you know, Japanese and Chinese traditional clothing, that's also been uh, kind of reinvigorated, but really on the pricey high end of things, right? Those are much more uh, you know, form flattering, much more you know, stylish, elegant, and there's a big price to pay with that, but because it's form flattering, right? If you're gonna be spending $2,000 on something, you want something that makes you look great, right? I, I get it, I get it. Um, Hanboks though, they were adopted from a Chinese style of dress uh, at that time, but they were purposely made less sexy. There's no other way to put it. Uh, humbugs were purposely designed to not be form-flattering. It's not your body it's supposed to accentuate. The colors are supposed to be what's accentuated, right? Uh, so because of that, it's really hard to adapt and modernize, it. and that's something that a lot of Koreans are working on. So if you are interested in art and design, if you're interested in fashion, this is the problem that you want to tackle. If you find the key, if you are that person that can modernize the hanbok for the modern Korean woman, you will be rich, I promise. Uh, the other han I want to talk about is hanok, ok, that's traditional Korean, Korean houses. Like I said, as you can see, the roofs are designed slightly different than their Chinese counterparts. Uh, you probably also notice you don't see a lot of these anymore. Depending on what country you come from, there's probably plenty of houses that are over 70 years old, right? In America, America doesn't even have that long of a written history. You can find houses 100, 200, 300 years old. You can't really do that in Korea. Most old houses are gone. And there's kind of two reasons for it. Uh, the first is the Korean War. Just a lot of stuff got destroyed, right? It's just kind of a you know, bad news bears for everyone. Uh, but a lot of the houses that did survive the Korean War, a lot of them were purposely destroyed. The idea was, again, that neophilia idea, is that they represented the old, right? You know, nowadays, if you think about living in a gray apartment building, it might, you know, feel depressing or sad, but the Koreans in the 1960s and 70s, living in a gray apartment is, is proof of your economic progress. It's, it's showing the country getting better. It's, it's, a, it's a thing of pride and envy, even, right? Even for a, a lot of modern Koreans, you look at 
you know, Korean celebrities, they don't live in houses. They live in apartments. It's all the same apartment, right? Every Korean celebrity has the same exact apartment. You walk in, you take off your shoes. Here's the living room with the TV and the sofa. Here's a bedroom. There's the bathroom and another bedroom. Here's the kitchen. Every celebrity in Korea, the exact same house, right? Um, but thankfully, there were Koreans that had foresight to say, hey, there is a lot of history here. Let's not destroy all of them. So they created these little Hanuk villages. There's actually uh, one here in Seoul and another one in Gyeonggi. Uh, highly recommend you check them out. Uh, that are some of these original houses that were still standing in the 1950s. In fact, one of my old professors uh, from Korea University, a super old guy, one of those tenured guys that comes back and teaches once, you know, one class every semester. Uh, he was actually part of the Yangban class, uh, basically the landlords, the, the richest people in Korea at the end of the Chosen Dynasty. But the Korean War happened, and he got pushed out uh, all the way down to Pusan, right, as North Korea came through. And North Koreans, they took all their stuff. They took all their, their belongings. And so what ended up happening is... Uh, when they made it back to Seoul, when the South Korean army and the U.S. army pushed back up and reclaimed Seoul, they had the house, but all their belongings were taken. So they went from one of the richest families in Korea to just poor like everyone else. And so the Korean government actually offered to buy their house from them and preserve it in one of these Hanuk villages. Uh, and they were able to use that money to kind of restart their life. His dad became a teacher, and eventually, you know, he became a professor, right? Um, all this happened when he was a, a kid. Uh, but he actually took us to that Hanuk and showed us, hey, yeah, this is my room. This is where I was, I was born. All right, real quickly, sorry. I want to check how I'm doing on time. Bup, 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 bup. Okay, uh, we've still got a little bit of time here. I apologize. I tend to, uh, I tend to talk a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm a lecturer by nature, uh, if you couldn't tell already. Uh, you can see uh, Hanoks in Korea, um, but they're mostly in the countryside but they're not exactly like this, right? This Hanuk here um, you know, is the more traditional kind. Most of the Hanuks you'll see in, in the countryside in Korea, they look a little bit like this, but there's something off. And it's not until you get closer and go inside and you realize the outside looks like a Hanuk, but the inside is a modern house. Uh, that style, that kind of mixture of the old and the new is kind of trendy for a lot of retirees in Korea. My sister-in-law, her husband's uh, parents have one of those. My in-laws have one of those. Um, that's kind of like if you have a certain amount of wealth in Korea and you can afford land and to build your own house, that's kind of what a lot of Koreans want to do, right? Um, do, 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 do. Uh, moving is designed to dry the pillars in the raising season, like I said before. Um, but another area where Hanoks are actually really interesting is how they are designed for Korean weather. It's not just the rain. So it's kind of hard to see here. Uh, but the walls of a, of a hanok can actually pulled, be pulled out and up. That way you can have a complete cross breeze throughout the entire house. So Korean summers, uh, you haven't experienced a Korean summer yet. You will soon. They are awful. <laughs> Korean summers are some of the worst summers this side of freaking Florida. Uh, or, you know, Iraq. They're just not fun. Uh, so uh, having that perfect cross breeze throughout the entire house is actually, you know, pretty cool. Uh, but it's not just that. In the winter, where they cook the food is down below the house so that while you're cooking food, not the smoke, the smoke's gone, going one way, but the heat is actually going through the floor up into the house. So because of that, the floors were actually the warmest places of the house. And this is something Korean houses still keep. Uh, maybe not, you know, buildings like this. I have no idea what the dormitories are like. Uh, but every place I've lived in Korea, it's heated from the floor up, which makes sense because heat rises. Like, that's so smart. Why doesn't every country in the world do that? I don't know. Uh, but it's great. In fact, so much so that uh, during the winter, if it gets really cold, uh, a lot of Koreans, including my wife and my son and I, They'll actually sleep on the floor. They'll put a mat on the floor because that's the hottest part of the house. And then they'll just, you know, get a blanket and kind of sleep there on the floor. Uh, Korean martial arts. So uh, Taekwondo actually um, is kind of an older martial art in Korea. Its name literally means hand, hand and feet. Uh, but if you've practiced Taekwondo, 
you'll realize there's not a lot of hand with Taekwondo. It's very, very feet orientated. So what happened? Well, it's during the Japanese annexation. A lot of things that were deemed a little too Korean, especially when Japan started losing the war and they started absorbing in uh, as many you know, facets of Korean culture as they could, uh, they started burning a lot of things and banning a lot of things. And sadly, the fist portion of Taekwondo was lost. Uh, but the kicking portion was saved as well as expanded upon. And so it actually uh, became a very popular sport in Korea. In fact, up until 2002, if you asked what was Korean's favorite sport, it wasn't baseball, it wasn't soccer, it was Taekwondo. And a lot of this was due to military training. So in the Korean army, you have to take a martial art and Taekwondo is the most popular one taught. So almost every Korean male has had at least a couple years of training. And at high school, when you had uh, training, they used to do military drills in high schools as well. Um, one of the things you could use as a substitute was Taekwondo. And so most Korean men grew up you know, doing some kind of Taekwondo. In fact, it's so ingrained in the culture. Uh, if you watch old Korean men fight each other, you think of old, like, old, you know, you know, American men, they're like, put them up, put them up. Uh, but old uh, Korean men, they got their hands in their pockets, and, they go, and they're all kicking each other when they, when they get angry. Uh, yeah, like it's very ingrained that far into the culture. There was actually an incident in the Major League Baseball, MLB in America, where a, uh, a Korean who was playing on an American team, he got mad at another player, and he kicked them. And that never happened in Major League Baseball before. And so they had to make a ruling on it. And the ruling that they decided on was to give him a harsher penalty than a punch uh, under the idea that a kick is more severe than a punch. And a lot of Korean fans got upset. And they sent in letters explaining that culturally speaking, a kick in Korea would be the culture equivalent of you know, swinging at a guy in America. And they actually succeeded in getting the rule changed. So MLB nowadays, uh, you know, not supposed to kick or punch anybody, but now they're treated uh, much more similarly in terms of punishment. Uh, Taekwondo became globally known after the 1980 Olympics. So if you're not familiar with how the Olympics works, when you host the Olympics, you're given the option of either adding a new sport or adding a team to an existing sport that is guaranteed access to the Olympics. Uh, so in South Korea's case, for the Winter Olympics, they had a hockey team. And the hockey team was guaranteed a chance to play in the games. They didn't do too hot, but it is what it is. Uh, but for their summer games in 1988, they added Taekwondo. And uh, they, took all, they, they took almost all the middles in 88, of course, because, you know, they introduced it was their sport. But if you look at it nowadays, it's super competitive, right? There's Japanese Taekwondo fighters, there's Russian, there's Brazilian, American that are really competitive. So Korea is not guaranteed medals in Taekwondo anymore. It's becoming a much more global sport. Uh, Shidem, it's been called Korean wrestling, which I guess kind of makes sense, or Korean sumo wrestling, which makes a little less sense, but like you look at them, like you can kind of see that kind of connection there. So Shidem, is a type of wrestling, type of sport, uh, that's very popular in Korea and is associated with uh, Chuseok, the holiday. Um, so even now, if you're here in Korea during Chuseok in the fall, you'll see Shino matches happening uh, on live TV, and a lot of villages will have their own version of it. Because of its association with like, strength and fighting, it became heavily associated with bulls. And so the prize for winning one of these matches in the past was you got a bull. Um, and, you know, cows are expensive if you're living in a poor country. Uh, so my father-in-law actually, as a younger man, won one of these bulls at one point uh, at a shooting competition during Chuseok at a, at a younger age. Nowadays, though, you're not going to get a bull. You're going to get, you know, steak, right? <laughs> it's uh, symbolic of what you used to get for winning one of these competitions. Uh, probably the most famous... Uh, Shidem uh, wrestler uh, is actually no longer a wrestler. Uh, Kang Ho Dong, he is actually a, a, an MC. Um, so he's like a television host and personality. Um, he's got kind of an Andre the Giant story, if you remember who he was, uh, the French wrestler. Um, he, it, they, they were both men who were physically very strong, very intimidating, but that's not their reputation. Their reputation is 
you meet this guy and he's just so nice. Right? He's so funny and he's so kind and he's, you know, he's just so charismatic. So in Andre Giant's case, he became an actor. And in MC Mung's case, he became a comedian, right? People would meet this famous wrestler and they're like, wow, you're like really funny. Uh, you should do something with that. And so he did. Um, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. So uh, two other Korean martial arts I want to talk about. The first is Gomdo. Uh, if you look at Gomdo and you're Japanese, you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute. That looks just like Kendo. It is Kendo. So what happened is Japanese annexation, uh, a lot of places, the Japanese uh, military government was replacing things that they saw, thought was too Korean with something that was uh, more appropriately Japanese. Uh, Kendo was one of them. So whenever uh, Japan lost the Second World War and uh, had to leave Korea, um, there was a big movement to just destroy anything that was Japanese, just get rid of everything Japanese. But you're talking about 40 years, um, or 35 years, there are two generations of Koreans who grew up in a Korea um, that had always been occupied by Japan. And to them, there was so much good in Kendo, it made no sense to get rid of all of it, right? You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So what they ended up doing is keeping Kendo and then just tweaking things to make them Korean, right? It's no longer based on Bushido code. It's uh, now based on Sheila warrior code. But they just keep the tenets exactly the same, right? Um, so it's kind of a, it sounds goofy. It sounds like a stupid workaround. But just kind of put yourselves in their perspective at the time. Uh, the one side just wanting to get rid of it just because it's Japanese. And the other side wanting to hold on to it. But also, you know, having those bad memories. It, it kind of makes sense from that perspective. But Kendo's still around, and Korea does pretty okay with it. Um, Hapkido is another one, uh, another adaptation here in Korea. Um, it's actually slowly gaining prominence in Korea, mostly because it's, it's all defensive. I mean, you have punches and kicks, but it's mostly like blocks and throws and that sort of thing. And because of it, uh, it's very popular for moms. <laughs> in Korea, moms are very afraid of their intellectual child because every child in Korea has to be an intellectual uh, getting hurt doing one of these dangerous sports. And so the one that's all you know, flips and blocks rather than punches and kicks is obviously going to appeal to them. It's also super cheap. When you think of a lot of hawk ones in Korea, you're paying anywhere from $20 an hour to $50 an hour for training. But for Hapki, though, you're paying like closer to like, you know, five to you know, eight bucks an hour. Uh, it's just much more cost effective, especially if it's something you're going to be doing for four or five, six years, right? My nephew actually recently got his uh, Idan, his level two uh, black belt in Hapki, though. And my son is starting Hapki, next spring, so a year from now. And so I want to do that with him. I think that'd be really cute. Okay. So quick uh, summary, and then I'll let you go home. Multifaceted belief systems and adaptations. Um, I hear a lot of people say Korea likes to steal stuff, right? Now, Korean culture is just you know, stealing from Japan and China. Uh, I like the word adaptation, right? They adopt it, and then they adapt it, right? They kind of tweak it a little bit, make it a little more Korean, right? They kind of influence uh, each other. Confucianism, strongly associated with, with uh, education here in Korea. Buddhism is heavily associated not just with how Koreans think of karma and reincarnation, but also art and even modern art. Uh, Christianity, it's associated with modernity as well as patriotism. Shamanism and folk traditions, uh, they still exist even to this day. You might be able to, to experience them yourselves. And like I said in Korea, you're never purely one. You're, you're kind of blends of all of them with one being the most important to you. Seems to be the uh, most common algorithm for uh, Koreans. Hanok and traditional architecture. Ancient architecture at its finest. Uh, at its peak, you know, at the time when a lot of those innovations were created, Hanoks were some of the uh, most, you know, ingenuitous you know, creations of the architectural world for adapting to the climate at the time. Nowadays, they're seen as kind of old, but, you know, a lot of Koreans still appreciate for them for what they were. 
and Korean martial arts, the reviving classics, as well as adapting imports. All righty. That's it for today. Uh, again, please write down all your questions. I love questions. And again, uh, you might notice something that I completely forgot to mention that happens every semester. Uh, please write down your questions, bring them in and ask. I love questions. Next week <clears throat> is going to be uh, Korean history. So you're actually not going to be reading chapter three of the Geek in Korea book. You're going to be reading two chapters from the Michael Breen book. So check the syllabus to make sure you're, you're reading the correct chapters. You just need to read two of them so you get a rough idea about Korean history. Again, keep in perspective, the Michael Breen book, The New Koreans, is written at a very pessimistic time. Uh, so it has that very pessimistic tone in it, but uh, it's still very good writing. Uh, so, uh, but it is a little dense. Uh, but do your best, please. Okay, I'll see you next week.